Um, we will now actually shift into our first panel of the day. I would like to invite Mr. Ben Rooney, senior editor from Wall Street Journal, to host. Thank you. I'm over here. Um, I didn't know about that Wall Street Journal poll, uh, so uh, it's not like a big setup, I promise you. Uh, um, but um, that was very good news indeed. Um, right, well, after that uh, very interesting uh, that very interesting presentation, uh, I, I'm very proud to present a panel that's made up almost entirely of men. So um, that's going to be... <laughs> that's going to be... Well, we'll see what happens after that. So I would like to call up, uh, call up my panel. Um, I've made so many notes I can't find who they... Right. So we would like to call down uh, Li Gong Chen from China. Thank you very much. If you... right. Nure, if you'd like to join us. Uh, Zohar Serenko from Tel Aviv, John Rosson from Paris, and David Solomon. If you'd like to just make your way down. And while they're uh, assembling themselves, John, if you just sit on this one here, let, let, uh, there you go, and get on there. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Thank you. We do get to play, yes. Uh, I love the beach setting, uh, it's uh, very appropriate. Um, very briefly, uh, uh, I'm just going to introduce myself and then uh, we'll crack into the panel. Uh, as Ian said, my name is Ben Rooney. I'm the technology editor of the Wall Street Journal Europe. Um, we, uh, you may be wondering what the Wall Street Journal Europe is doing uh, here. We take a Eurovision Song Contest v uh, view of Europe, um, which means one day I plan to get to Azerbaijan as well. Um, but uh, if you cover technology, um, and uh, if you cover technology, it is impossible not to uh, include Tel Aviv uh, in your beat. Um, the panel today, uh, we've got a fantastic brief um, on overcoming barriers to innovation. And what I want to do uh, is spend a very little bit of time discussing what those problems are. Um, and then I want to spend most of our time uh, salt trying to find solutions to those problems. Most things, it's always the other way around. You spend 80% of your time talking about the problems and only 20% talking about the solutions. So, very briefly, uh, we, have one, we have one microphone, um, so we're going to have to play pass around with it. Um, if you can just introduce yourselves uh, and just say who you are, I think would be very helpful. So if we start, ladies first, of course. Thank you. I'm, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here, first time here in Israel, in Tel Aviv. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Again, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Um, I'm Nurai Gukop. I'm working for the city of Amsterdam. Uh, I'm an open innovation advisor there. Hello, likewise, very grateful to be invited. Delighted to be here. Tel Aviv is a city that I've known since I was about two years old but never had the chance to actually live in and the transformation of this city is amazing. My background is in humanitarian diplomacy, national governments and for the last two years I've been based in Brazil working with the complexity of an relatively anonymous city and how that city finds its place in the 21st century. David Solomon. My name is John Rassant. I'm uh, the head of the New Cities Foundation, which is a relatively new nonprofit uh, uh, foundation. We're based in Geneva, but we operate uh, all around the world. Thank you, Ryan. And I also want to congratulate you, Mr. Mayor, uh, and your team for putting on this terrific um, event. Um, we bring together uh, uh, private sector, public sector, research institutions, municipalities around the world to uh, help solve the problems of cities in the 21st century. Hi, um, my name is uh, Zohar Sisenko. I'm from uh, Tel Aviv uh, Municipality, uh, head of the uh, um, new media unit in the spokesperson uh, office. Uh, what we try to do is kind of understand how to use the new uh, public sphere which developed uh, in Facebook and on Twitter, and, uh, internet forums, and how can we use the knowledge on the internet uh, of the citizens to make the city hall better? My, my name is Chen Li Gong. I, I come from uh, Beijing, China. Uh, my, I work uh, in the Beijing Municipal Science Technology Commission. Uh, in the 
Uh, I'm colleague of Mr. Chen, so I will introduce him to, to you. Uh, and he is working in the Beijing Commission of Science and Te Technology. Uh, that, that is, government is responsible for the science and te technology innovation of the city. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, fantastic panel. Truly global. I think the first thing I would like to do is I would like to ask the panel, since, since the... Uh, since our topic is overcoming barriers to innovation, what they think the biggest barrier to innovation is. I think if we start with you, what is the biggest, what do you think is the biggest barrier to innovation? So, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would, I should say sorry, I can't speak I can't answer the question by myself because my English is, so, is not so good. So I would, I would invite my co-work, Mrs. Renpei, to translate my, my answer. Thank you. OK. Uh, OK, uh, let, let me uh, answer this question on the behalf of Mr. Chen. Uh, so I think the uh, biggest um, barrier of the innovation is the um, how to make most of the people agreement on the reform of the innovation because uh, the reform is always going to change the, um, the interest pattern of the different levels people. Uh, so we think maybe it's uh, difficult to uh, how to consideration of all levels peoples of interest. Uh, and then uh, the second is that we should make a correct judgment uh, of the reform of the reform stage and uh, objective condition uh, so that we can make a, a practical policy for the reform. Uh, and then we think that the innovation reform is a systematic uh, en engineering um, problem. So maybe when we do the top level design, uh, we should research uh, relative a set of policies to avoid uh, have um, another, uh, something 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 problems caused. Okay. So uh, that's all. Excellent. Thank you. Let's just work our way around. What do you think is the biggest obstacle, the biggest barrier to innovation? All that innovation is well, out there. Here's a big barrier. Okay. I I prefer to talk about the city as uh, the problem we see. Um, I, I'd like to tell you a story. Um, Fantastic. Our mayor is sitting over there. Decided a few years ago that he wants the city. Uh, citizens to use more bicycles. Now, uh, for us, it's something new, okay? For Tel Aviv, for Israel at, at all. One of the first uh, things uh, he did was to make more bicycle routes all over the city. Um, and when we did, uh, when we went to a small street, Bloch Street, uh, a lot of people said, don't, we don't want this bicycle lane because we want to keep our car here, we want to keep the parking space we have and uh, we, we won't let you take our parking space uh, that we had for years, for years and years. So um, uh, to do so, we had to make them understand why, um, why we need to crack this uh, barrier, why we need to, um, uh, um, to make new bicycle lanes, to uh, uh, dispose cars from uh, the city centers. And to get to this point, we had to make them a part of the decision. We had to talk to them. We had to use Facebook to talk to them, to talk with them. We had to bring uh, people that understand, uh, people that ride bicycles, to talk with the citizens. We used Facebook events to do so. Uh, and in the end, I guess we got the mission. And um, today, I ride, I'm myself. I ride bicycle every day to work, and I see people use the, bas the bicycle line, line and less uh, cars on the street. So I think. Once you uh, make the people a part of the new thing you do in your city, um, it makes it possible. Okay, so the obstacle there was resistance from the people, conservatism, they didn't like change, and the solution that you brought was to make everybody a part of it and bring everybody in. At the end we did. By the way, it took us a, it took us a while because the yeah. uh, first thing we did was just declaring, this is what we're doing. But um, uh, after a while we understood that once we'll talk to them, once we'll, uh, once we'll explain, why we're doing this, um, things will get much better, and it did. Fantastic. So, so, so we've got two things there. So the problem was people resistance, and then you've also answered your own problem with the solution, which was bringing people in. John, what's uh, the biggest obstacle? Well, I mean, I think um, 
you know, innovation is about uh, reframing problems so you can encourage previously unimaginable solutions. And I think one of the barriers uh, to innovating is a kind of very siloed approach. And on a city level, that means um, the, the public sector, the mayor operating very much in his or her sphere only without a lot of interaction from the private sector, from the research community. So I think we're seeing that breaking down and, and, and in a very positive way. And we see that here in Tel Aviv and in a lot of the um, great innovative cities um, where you have a very fluid relationship between research community, city hall, uh, the private sector. Um, and, you know, for example, and that's one of the things that our foundation likes to promote. Um, for example, San Jose, capital of Silicon Valley, uh, the municipality came to us and said, can you help us work on a problem uh, of commuting? There are a lot of commuters, and commuting is a very important problem for all cities, for uh -huh. in developed countries, in developing countries. Um, and so we brought together uh, big groups like Ericsson from Sweden, uh, Waze, which is an Israeli startup, uh, the municipality. i just jump in. What was the problem with the commuters? Was it like there was too many of them? Was it they were in the wrong place? I mean, it was the, the, the issue is how to kind of uh, make commuting more efficient, how to um, uh, reduce it, uh, how to bring uh, very advanced social networks into play in order to create communities of commu commuters to. Uh, kind of make it a better experience, okay. but also you can cut down CO2 emissions, things like that. Right. And it's okay. been a you know, great project. We're still working on it. And what was the solution? How did you do it? Well, I mean, we're working with you know, massive amounts of big data, so it's, uh, um, it, it allows you to look at how can you optimize flows, how can you create sub-communities of commuters, and we're still working on the results. Okay, so, so you had this problem there, and so the solution that you used there was a technological solution, bringing in big data to, add, to provide a, a really solid analytical base. Yes, I would say so. That's a great, okay, fantastic. David. Thank you. I would echo verbatim what John has said, so I won't repeat it, but it's exactly the synergy between the different groups in a society. And I would therefore, because John's just said what he said, I'd build on that. The work that I'm experiencing over the last two years in Brazil is one of very entrenched views of one's own role. So the business community, the media, the interface between the citizens and their government, and of course the government, federal government, state government, city government, deeply entrenched views, which in the case of Brazil, in some cases goes back to the 19th century, never mind the 20th, and in some cases even before that. Most people, whoever I speak to, regarding any urban innovation project we're working on, tell me your biggest problem, David, is the fact that one third of the world's gold came from this part of Brazil in the 18th century. <laughs> Therefore, we do not trust anyone. We don't even trust our own mothers and our brothers. There's a feeling of suspicion and paranoia. So therefore, anyone coming in with innovation, the first question we ask is, what the hell are you doing here? What is your interest? Why are you coming? What are you trying to get out of it? First of all, breaking down those barriers of how a government feels its role is and what its responsibilities are is key. But it's not only the government, it's every other sector of society. So once Tel Avivians feel that this is completely their city and that Ron Khuldai is the man to facilitate you to get on with your innovation, creative cities, as he put up there on the slide, then you are empowered to get out there and do stuff. It's not just about waiting for your municipality to clear up the garbage and for them to organize the innovation. It's your city. In the same way if it were your family, if it were your kibbutz, moshav, company, and that transformative aspect on how we regard our own role, for me, is where the explosion is yet to come. We're seeing it in certain cities. In Detroit, people taking it upon themselves to regenerate urban agriculture to feed themselves, but this I think is going to be a very exciting area and anyone who's involved in the synergy between the different stakeholders is playing with the most exciting, creative, innovative social fabric. It's going to change, it already is, but it's going to change big time. Okay, so to summarise on that one then, so it seems what you're saying is that, that one of the obstacles to innovation has been existing power structures, um, be they government or be they other bodies, uh, and, and the solution to that is a bit like picking up on your social, net, uh, the social networking, which is just empower the citizens to do it despite the government or despite those power holders not 
you know, through them or because of them. So get them out there and motivate them. Absolutely. Very zen. Do not look at your government as an obstacle opposition barrier. Look at working with all the governances, governance of the private sector, the third sector, governance of the non-governmental organizations, those who seem to be traditionally always in opposition, but create spaces and processes that allow the synergy to emerge. This is very complex stuff. It's very new. We've lived in cities and we have structures in our head about yeah. how they're meant to operate. Yeah, totally. We need to change our identity. So his identity as the mayor is now, he's becoming a facilitator. He's becoming the kind of Eden Rechel, getting all these musicians on stage and let them do their thing. It's not just about me doing it. So create safe spaces that manage the complexity, that don't reduce it. That's very important. Don't try to simplify this because the richness is in the complexity. Fantastic. Excellent. Now, as the only person qualified to talk about any of this, um, because you're the only female on the, on the panel and the rest of us are incompetent, uh, um, Nure, talk about setting you up. Um, how do we Thank solve you. our problems? <clears throat> well, after hearing you guys, I'm... Um, the, sorry? More women. More women, yes, <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah, barriers for innovation. Barriers for innovation. What are the barriers? What are the problems that there you've encountered? There are many in barriers. There are many barriers. Um, although in Amsterdam we are involved in many innov innovative, innovative projects on EU level, uh, national, Amsterdam district level. Uh, so we are we are doing our best. Uh, I think the barriers are actually um, <coughs> funding, money. Uh, for innovation, you have to you have to invest. And uh, what we are facing uh, in, in Amsterdam, in Holland, due to the economical crisis, is that there are a lot of budget costs. So that means that if there is an innovative project, usually people are like, mm, let's just do the daily operation. No innovation for us. We're already busy with our nine to five jobs. I don't know what you're talking about. It's too abstract. Right. It's new. So I think money is, is an enabler because you say, you, here you have money, so it means that the people have, get time to work on these innovative projects. So that's one. Uh, the second one is more of a translation from a global, national, uh, to a local level. Uh, what I'm experiencing in these projects are that, first of all, these are a lot of like concepts that not a normal person understands. I mean, it's not really complex, but you need to have some time. Then you need to make like a translation of what does it mean for your work? For, because we have like 15,000 people uh, working at the city of Amsterdam. Everyone is doing a different job. One person is cleaning the streets. One person is like an urban planner. So what is the impact? What, what do these uh, projects and in initiatives offer for them, we need to help them. So that's a barrier and a solution right there. Okay, so that's the work, the city workers themselves. Exactly. Right, okay. But, <laughs> I'm not finished. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> <laughs> it's also what is needed, it sounds very simple, is a mind shift of management. Um, because what we see is not only, well, we have seen the big data uh, visualized, we have a lot of uh, old boys networks. Um, but what you see in these grassroots initiatives is that a child of 12 year, a 12 year old can start up its own company. And um, these young people don't have the experience and actually the burden of an organizational <coughs> culture. So I think as a, uh, one of the barriers in this whole field is also government. Mm -hmm. But not only government, also pri uh, private companies. We have, I mean, IBM is sponsoring in this, but one of the big boys like IBM, Microsoft, these companies are here for a long time and they have these, also these organizational cultures. At one point they are doing innovation, but if you look inside, there is a culture that is also a barrier for innovation from within. So from my point of view, I'm working for the city of Amsterdam, for the government. So my job is to facilitate this inner change within the city. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So summarizing, and then I'm just going to go to the audience, see if they, if, if they think we've got everything. So essentially the obstacles are 
uh, money was one, uh, a lack of, lack of resource. Uh, existing power structures, particularly, it seems to me, the government seems to be a problem, uh, is a, a, a conservatism um, or just resistance to change. People, you know, it's like, ah, uh, you know, I know how it all is, and it's like, oh, why change it at all? Okay, it doesn't work, but, you know, fine, we know what it is. Um, and I think those were the main ones. So money, power structure, and conservatism. Does anyone think we've missed anything? Is there anything that you, any other obstacles that you've identified? Anyone here who's worked on change product projects at a municipal or a governmental level? Things that we've missed. Gentlemen at the front. I don't think we just. Um, I'm Oliver Rothschild from London. Um, I believe that people are scared of innovation. So scared. the general public is scared. Before Christopher Columbus, the world was square. What happened to the other side? So it's a question of engaging with people. I mean, not just about changing car park situation. Engaging that this is not something to be scared about. And politically, we have a mayor here who is a unique type of person who will listen to the people and will, will translate what the people want, if it's workable, into reality, rather than being dictatorial about things. OK. Any other? Any other change? Any, anyone else got anything? At the back. Yeah, just shout out. We haven't got time for my... What? Politics. Politics. Yeah. Very good point. Any other? Any other obstacles? Yeah. Gentleman at the back. The terminology of innovation itself. Brilliant. So create it. So we should we should be using the term creativity. Okay. So that's got us some groundwork. We, I'm conscious we haven't got a huge amount of time. Let's talk about how do we solve these problems. We had a great one. Yours was use of social media. We've had big data. Seems to me one of the problems that we have, and maybe uh, the mayor can comment on this. We have this phenomenal resource of talent out there. I mean, I spend all my time talking to entrepreneurs. And, and you know, there is no shortage of talent and no shortage of ideas, but how do they get those things to change? And no disrespect to, to the people who work for the government, um, in my experience, the problem is always the government. Um, it's always government getting in the way. So how do we get the government out of the way, or how do we get the government to work with them to facilitate it? Who wants to pick that one up? I, I have you to. work for the government. <laughs> I have to. <laughs> it's, a government. It's like you're talking to me. So, <laughs> well, actually, we are working together. It's from the Amsterdam Economic Board point of view. This term of triple helix is always uh, used. Triple helix. Triple helix. Okay. Which like is DNA a, plus. Uh, ex yeah, that's nice. <laughs> It's, it's government working with private companies and also with educational uh, like universities. So we are already working together with all of these organizations. So it's on a board level already. So for example, the, the head of IBM Holland is So what do you it. do? How do you work with them? What does that mean? With, what it means is we have like many projects. Uh, so within these projects, for example, Apps for Amsterdam. This is a contest. This year it was uh, organized the second time. It w last year it was so successful that it's on a national level, Apps for, Apps for Holland. So we have this whole open data community and app developer community. And, you, and the government did this? It's, government is part of it. Part so of it. actually okay. with when we work together, we work like a sort of a network organization. It's not really a traditional top-down, I'm the project manager or program manager. Okay. It's a different way of working together. And what change did that affect? Because Apathons, mm -hmm. here's the, uh, I, I, the dirty dark secret of Apathons, which is they, everyone gets together and they produce fantastic things and then nothing happens afterwards. They, the great ideas come out of these things and there's no continuity. But, I mean, this is also innovation by itself. It's incremental. It's like the okay. first, first step is just doing it. I mean, you can't... So just do it. Just do it. Anyone else, any comments on how do we involve... How do we get the government to be part of the solution and not part of the problem? Because too much government is usually the problem. I think let's, we've got very limited time, so I'm not going to give you loads of case studies, but I'd just throw give one... Give me a great example. I'll throw one out here. Why does... Tel Aviv, for example, not establish as part of the Global City International Affairs Department 
an annual competition where a serious amount of funding is available and every citizen from the age of five years old up until the age of 85, no barriers whatsoever to engage with this competition, is actually coached in the way that filmmakers are coached how to make a good film and make a good film script. They're coached in how to come up with a really viable plan and project which will inc increase the livability of the citizens of their city. Only they know their city, only they know what it's like to be a five-year-old in their city, or a 10-year-old, or an 85-year-old. Very important, we hear a lot now about prototypes for cities. Every city is so unique, as we are as individuals, as families. Each one has its own creative gold. Don't try to overlay the unique universal laws for the prototype of the perfect city. Excuse the expression, but bullshit. It's just not, that's gonna suppress creativity. For the last few weeks, while I've been thinking of coming here, I've been talking to a lot of people about what would be wonderful for Tel Aviv. And a lot of the people that I speak to happen to be people in national politics. They're people in the world of conflict and diplomacy. So they were, they're thinking with that head. And an idea started to formulate, and I'm gonna throw this one out. Why does Tel Aviv, for example, not establish a serious international cities division? An institute where all the citizens of the city, this is not top down, but all the citizens of the city, the 3.3 million Tel Avivians, have access to this institution to connect with other cities around the world. Okay, I'm conscious of the time. I've, our high-tech scoreboard has just told me um, <laughs> that I have five minutes. Man with a piece of paper. Um, so I want some questions. I want some questions from the audience. Um, we have five minutes worth of good questions. You have a fantastic panel. So let's get some questions about, or share some, share some examples where you have worked with people and, and you've affected change and how you've tapped that innovation. So who's got a question or who's gonna share something? Come on, don't be embarrassed. Yes, lady here. Street festivals. Yeah. Street festivals, encouraging people out into the streets, getting them out there. Are there street festivals in Tel Aviv? There must be street festivals. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Every Friday. <laughs> There's a permanent street festival. <laughs> um, any other? Any other? Any other questions? Any other examples? What an incurious lot you are. Uh, um, any other ways of tapping the. I Where? Who had a. Over there, sorry, didn't see you. Who wants to pick that one up? John, you've got the microphone in your hand, so bad time to have the microphone in your hand. Boy, if I knew the answer to that question. Yeah. Um, I don't know how to answer that one. But what I do know is that, you know, when you're talking about government as the problem, not the solution, uh, I'm not sure I agree, because I think it depends on what government you're talking about. Okay. And one of the interesting things about cities and city governments is that they have the capacity to really do cool things in a way that no national government can. Right. Because cities are, can be, not always are, but can be um, very uh, effective units um, where you can actually make things happen. And right. even in a, a country uh, like Israel, which is small, compact uh, population, you know, a, a, a Tel Aviv government can do things that a national government can never do. Right. And, could, 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 and, and that's why we see so much innovation here. So I think that's going to be one of the interesting things to look at in the coming decades is that sort of interplay between national government and you know, national regulatory so pushing, processes and what's happening in cities. So pushing power down effectively or, or bringing well, I don't power know if it's up. pushing it down, but I think, I think we're seeing power actually devolve to cities. like that. <laughs> so, you know, a, a, a Belgium may be kind of 
disappearing almost as a national entity. But well, it, it had a good go but, at doing that anyway. So. But, but <laughs> you know, uh, 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 city states. Yeah, and I think we're seeing that clearly in Europe. City states, later from, but yeah, or or the, or, or the, the Germany before the uh, unification of Germany, yes, 1871. Right. Go back to that. Um, yes, gentlemen in the front. Okay, so ch cheap rent as a way of providing a, an, an environment for innovation. Who wants to pick that up? Yep. I'm doubting. Um, there are oh. a lot of offices uh, now due to the economical crisis that, that are empty. So we are uh, experimenting with creative ways of sort of like pop-up offices, sharing offices that uh, a lot of these entrepreneurs uh, or s small startups, they need office space, but so you don't have the traditional model of renting like the whole uh, space, but you say like I just I'm just part of the space. Right. So there are many of these examples that I can think of now. Okay, we have unfortunately the laser holographic three-dimensional scoreboard uh, has just told us that uh, our time is up, which is a terrible shame. Um, because it was a fantastic panel. I have a theory, which I haven't yet... I want, I want to kind of write this story, but I haven't worked it out. And it strikes me that, that the three... And, 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 and this is a very serious question about Medellin. I don't know very much about Medellin, but I wonder what Medellin's gay community is like. Because if you look at the most innovative cities in Europe, not only... There is a very strong correlation between cities that have a very liberal attitude, and a very... You know, Berlin, London... Uh, uh, Amsterdam, Stockholm, Tel Aviv was voted the gay capital of, of, of I think, of the world. Uh, um, so I'm interested. It's a, I haven't kind of made the connections on that. Um, anyway, unfortunately, we've run out of time. A an absolutely fantastic panel. Great way to start the day. Thank you very much indeed. That was fantastic. Always a welcome guest in the city. Um, Dr. Solomon is here today to sign a treaty with the city of Tel Aviv on the, on the exchange, the mutual exchange of practices and knowledge on green uh, um, practices, um, green uh, innovation. The city of Freiburg, uh, we should say, uh, is currently competing for the title the greenest city in Germany. This is a federal uh, title that will be granted to one city in Germany and you're currently one of the top three. Uh, you have been mayor for the past 10 years and you're the first mayor of a Green Party in a large city in Germany ever. There are 220,000 people in the city of Freiburg and you are the first mayor of a large city. Um, and the question is here now whether we're talking about innovation, I think uh, kind of like to dive into this topic of green cities. Maybe 10, 15 years ago green was the it word that mayors always mention. They want to be a green city, green city. Now everybody's talking about everybody wants to be innovative city. So are you uh, in that sense, passe? Is this a trend that has passed, or do you feel that the green policies are innovative or are here to stay? Uh, yes, we, we... It's mainstream now to be a green city, but uh, we want to be always uh, in front of the train. Uh, we want to make new things. But in a global, in a global measure, Freiburg is a, is, is a village with uh, 220,000 people. It's the half size of Tel Aviv. We are the number uh, 34 by size uh, in, in Germany, and, uh, but it started, it started in the 70s uh, in Freiburg, and this is the reason why, why we are uh, more advanced than other cities. It started with, uh, with the protest uh, against uh, uh, the building of a nuclear power plant 25 kilometers in the, uh, away from Freiburg, and this was, this was uh, the uh, uh, initiation of, uh, of uh, the environmental movement in Germany. And it was a very interesting panel we heard because uh, the question if it's the government or if it's uh, 
other things that are the most uh, uh, obstacles, the, the, the greatest obstacles and barriers. Uh, it's ridiculous. When, when they ask me, a lot of people come to Freiburg all around from uh, over the world to, to look what we're doing in, in, in uh, sustainability and renewable energies and so on. And uh, they ask me, what is the difference uh, of being a mayor in Freiburg and of being a mayor in another big city in, in, in Germany? And I tell them that's uh, the mentality of the people because when you are a mayor in another city, and you have, uh, you have plans for, for ambitious uh, environmental goals. Um, probably people say, this guy is crazy, uh, it's, it's too expensive, and why environmental, and uh, uh, do other things. And in, in, in Freiburg, it's, 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 uh, it's in the other way. Uh, people come from all over the world to look what we are doing, but the people in Freiburg, they say it's not enough. Uh, the government, uh, the mayor is, is doing nothing and the city council is doing nothing and they have to go on. Uh, so that the, the people push us to do more. And, and then I answer, it's the better job when you are convinced that you have to change, um, to, to change your city. It, it's better than people push you, then they, they hinder you. Yeah? You mentioned the cost. At the end of the day, all the mayors ask themselves, does this cost me money to be greener or do I save money being greener? And the sentiment, at least in Israel, is that this is something for maybe countries in Europe that don't have concerns, though today you have a lot of concerns. And are the people of Freiburg saying, or the people of Germany saying, okay, let's forget about this green stuff, we have an economy to save? It's both. It costs you money because you have to invest and you save money in the long run. For example, we are the city in the last 25 years in, in the state of Baden-Württemberg in the very southwest of Germany with about 11 million people. We are the city in, in, in Baden-Württemberg that, uh, that uh, created the most jobs and uh, we, are one, uh, we are the city that uh, is the one, only city that is really growing, not only the city but also the area and that's because of we are an attractive city. We have a, wonderful landscape it's not our it's not because of us but, <laughs> uh, but but people come to to freiburg to have jobs and to live there and so um the ecology and the environment and uh, uh it's sexy to to go to freiburg because we are a sustainable city it's our label now and it's attract, uh, attractive, yeah. I, uh, tell us briefly, and then we'll take maybe a few questions from the audience. When you walk into the office of the mayor in Freiburg, how does that look different from any other office? How do you see the sustainability in, in everyday practice? <laughs> My office was the office uh, of the mayors for the last hundred years. <laughs> so it's... <laughs> but you said something about the sugar yesterday when we discussed this, right? <laughs> yeah, but... Uh, you don't give sugar in packages, right? Uh, yes, it's, 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 uh, we, we were talking about yeah. It's procurement, yeah, we, we got uh, the, the coffee and the tea you get and the sugar. <laughs> uh, it's, 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 uh, it's with fair trade organizations and the procurement in uh, uh, everybody that the municipality needs. Uh, we buy uh, with social and ecological standards and uh, yeah, it's, just, it's sustainable. We want to be sustainable and the city council uh, decides uh, that we have even to get more sustainable than we are. Mm -hmm. Any questions from the audience uh, for the mayor of Freiburg who might be elected the most green mayor in Germany very shortly? Could you tell us about the most visionary project you're now leading or the things that people come to learn from you when they come to visit Freiburg? Uh, we create a new design of city. That means you have to change mentality, but in Freiburg it's easy, I told you. That means uh, the, 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 the issues of, of living and working, uh, that, that has to come together. We call it a sustainable urban, uh, urban planning and urban design. When we created new districts in the last 20 years, uh, we made uh, public transport, we made a tram system, we are still, uh, still building new tram lines and uh, so we, we, uh, we stopped uh, the rate of, uh, of, uh, of, car, of car traveling from going to point E to point B, uh, we stopped it by 30% only of 100, of 100 ways going from A to B and 70% it's run by, by trams and buses, uh, especially bicycle. Freiburg is a bicycle city and going by feet, 70% by environmental uh, transport and that's a good rate and we want to increase it even. Mm. So tonight we'll be signing a treaty of uh, agreement and understanding of mutual exchange and uh, we hope, uh, I know you're very good with solar panels, so you give us the panels, we'll give you the sun, okay? And uh, that's... Uh...
What David Solomon, Solomon says, me, I'm Solomon, he's Solomon. <laughs> what he says was very interesting. Every city is unique. And you, you cannot, you cannot uh, copy one city from another city, but you can learn from each other and you can, you, you can look if it, if it fits for your city. And that's the exchange of cities we have to, to, to make it better. So and you have to you, with you today a delegation, a large delegation of Freiburg, and we've been having a lot of exchange with the municipality of Tel Aviv. So we want to thank you for the partnership. And uh, We are very proud to cooperate with Tel Aviv because Tel Aviv is a wonderful city. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much, Mayor Salman. We will now break for coffee.